look, here's, here's a rundown of what I'm going to tell you about. I don't have any fancy graphics, and I have no way to prove what I'm telling you, except that it happened to me. It's one of those things that occurred that was mind-blowing and extraordinary, and it went on into quite a relationship, and I'll explain this to you. As you know, Kathy, my wife, and I had spent 20 years, and for me even longer, going back and forth to Peru. The goal was to find evidence of ancient civilizations. It was our belief that these people, whoever they were, and those records that were lost, might not be lost forever. That they would still be found somewhere high in the Andes at some distant location. So we spent a lot of time. We lived in Peru a couple of times, a year at a time. Uh, one year in the jungles, another year in the mountains. And it was an extraordinary experience. But let me back it up before I met Kathy. Because this is really where this story takes place. I had been taking people on journeys to South America for several years when this occurred. This was back when Machu Picchu was actually a user-friendly kind of place and not roped off with guards blowing whistles at every turn. One morning, while we were going up to Machu Picchu, there was this fellow. He was just walking along the dirt road, and this road going up to Machu Picchu is a switchback, and it takes you nearly an hour to go from the bottom at Agua Caliente to the top at the Machu Picchu parking area. It's a long walk if you were to do it. This fellow looked like a backpacker, smiling, not very long hair, um, and the bus stopped and gave him a ride. Now, myself, the buses were old and rickety, and I didn't really like the confi confined space. <clears throat> so what I would do is I'd climb on top of the bus where they have the rack, and I'd sit up there, and hold on as we're going up and up and up and up. I got Kathy up there once and she didn't like it. <laughs> Actually, very few people liked it because the drop-offs were quite severe. So this fellow, after stopping the bus, climbs up on top with me. And I thought, oh, that's great. We go riding up to Machu Picchu and we're talking. Not a lot, just casual conversation. And I said, um, so what's your name? And he says, I'm Rich. Said, All right. And where are you from? And he looked at me and he said, Jerry, I'm from the Pleiades. Now, I don't know this guy. I hadn't introduced myself yet. And so that was was a bit of a strange thing. He had this look in his eyes that was either madness or knowing. You've probably seen something like that, haven't you? Someone just looks at you and it's like, okay. I said, from the Pleiades, huh? And just sort of nodded and grinned, looked off to the side. We're going around a curve and there's a huge drop off. Now at this time, there was a book out that you might be familiar with. It's by Barbara Marciniak. It's called Bringers of the Dawn. And being from Phoenix, there were a lot of people there that were in the New Age community and they were channeling Pleiadians. Everybody was either a Pleiadian or they're channeling a Pleiadian. And I thought that was kind of goofy. And now here's this fellow on top of the bus telling me, with this crazy look in his eye, that he's Pleiadian. And I thought about it for a second and said, well, of course you are. And he says, no, really, I am. I said, okay. I said, you know, in Phoenix, well, have you heard of this book called Bringers of the Dawn? 
he said, kind of looked down and sideways, says, yeah, we're familiar with it. And I said, um, so it's supposed to be about Pleiadians. And he goes, you know, I could tell you some things, but really, that's not about us. It's channeled material. We, we don't do that. I thought that was a different kind of answer. And then it felt like I was becoming connected to him somehow. It's one of those feelings that you might have experienced yourself, where you just sort of feel like this kinship. We continued going up, and he continued to tell me that he had been in Venice Beach, California, that he was studying the culture there. I said, really, what, what, what is your profession? He says, well, I'm an anthropologist and an, um, a sociologist. And I spent three months there. And he was very articulate, almost scientific. And then he kind of grinned and looked up and says, it was far out, dude. <laughs> I said, okay. He says, but there's only so much of that that any of us can take. I said, well, I know, I've been there. He says, well, you see, it's a bit difficult for us to be in that environment for any length of time. The food is not good for us. Being around the people, it's very disturbing for us. And consequently, we have to get away and get back to a place that's more like home periodically. And I said, so there are others with you? And he said, well, yeah, we travel all over the world, and when we need a break, we come back here. We have a place near here that we live. He said, but it's not near enough, and I decided to come to Machu Picchu because I was told you were going to be here. I said, who told you that? He said, do you remember back when... Um, well, I'll just tell you, the, the fellow's name is Zoe, and you were in contact with him and some of the others back when you were a teenager. Well, they've been keeping an eye on you, and, and they said that you were going to be here, and so I decided that, um, well, at their recommendation that I would come and meet you, because there are things that you could do to help us, and there are some things we might be able to do to help you to understand better. I said, all right, well, that's very intriguing. I'm thinking to myself, how would this guy know about Zoe? Because I, at that point, I had not talked in public <clears throat> about my contacts. I'd kept most of that quiet because it just wasn't the sort of thing I wanted to go into. During the course of the conversation, we eventually moved on, got to Machu Picchu, and we got off. Now, in the complement of passengers that were with us was a fellow. Uh, his name was Bob. He was an emergency room psychologist in New York City. A really astute fellow, kind of quiet. Uh, tall, about 6'6". Six, six. And the reason I'm bringing him up is because of what happened next. Bob had this pair of, of uh, binoculars that were just gigantic. It was almost cartoonish. And he was walking around looking at birds and looking at things. Rich and I and our group proceeded on into the grounds at Machu Picchu. And Rich was going to go up to the top of Huayna Picchu. Huayna Picchu, when you're looking at Machu Picchu, it's that little peaky thing there in the, in the distance. There's a path that goes all the way up to the top of that. I've been there many times. It takes about, if you're in really good shape and you're running, you can make it in about 40 minutes. And for me, I've tried it, and it takes me about an hour and a half. There are too many nice views to not just stop and admire the scenery. Well, Rich says goodbye. He says, I'll... I'll I'd like to talk to you again later. Would that be all right? And I said, yeah, that'll be fine. So he takes off and he goes over to the temple of Pachamama, which is where the path going to Huayna Picchu is at. 
and he just disappears around the corner. I'm standing there talking to Bob. The rest of the group is like over here to my left, wandering around looking at things. And Bob was asking me, who is that guy? I said, I don't know. He said his name is Rich. Uh, he, he says he's recently been in Venice Beach. And he goes, oh, okay. And so I'm looking around. Someone says something. And I turn back and Bob says, taps me on the shoulder says, Jerry, your friend's already up there. I said, no, that's impossible. It had only been 10 minutes, if that long. And he goes, no, he's up there. So I took the binoculars. I hoisted him up. <laughs> Honestly, it was like gigantic. And I took a look. At the very peaky point at the top of Winapichu, there's Rich. And he's looking right at me. And he's smiling and waving with those, that crazy look in his eye. And I was just breathless. There's no way in the world he could have gotten there that quickly. And Bob says, how long do you say it takes to get up there? And I said, well, it must not take him very long at all. And so we went on about our business. We were due to go back to, whoops, I don't think this is working anyway. We were due to go back to Machu Picchu that evening. Well, during the, um, during the afternoon before we left, and probably about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there were clouds, you know, and if you've ever seen Machu Picchu, or if you've ever been there, you know this for sure, but there are these clouds that come up over the mountains, and it's just gorgeous. Uh, the sun is, is setting just off to the left of Huaynapichu, and people are, are talking and pointing. So, of course, we all take a look up, and there is this shiny thing about the size of a dime at arm's length. And it's just moving in and out of the clouds in a very steady fashion, slowly moving along. It's got the attention of a lot of folks. As <clears throat> we watch, it comes down lower and lower and lower. Now Machu Picchu is, is named after the mountain, Machu Picchu, which means old man. To the right of that peak, there's a saddleback. And it is there that this object finally descended, growing larger, and sat down right on, on the saddleback. It just sat there. So now everyone is transfixed, watching this incredibly shiny object, a UFO, just sitting there. Within a few minutes, there are people that get out, two people, I couldn't tell if they were male or female, but they get out, they walk around, then walk back to this direction and come back this side, sat down on the ground just looking in our direction. I couldn't find Bob anywhere. After a short time, the clouds just moved over the mountain and obscured everything and it was just gone from sight. So that was pretty interesting. And I reflected back on the conversation I'd had with Rich. I was wondering, <laughs> could that be him or some of his people? We left Machu Picchu to go get dinner. We went all the way back down the mountain. And then about 9 o'clock at night, we got back in the bus. We went back up to Machu Picchu after it's closed. The guard lets us into the gate, and we proceed on to the temple of Pachamama. And it's at this place that we're going to be sitting there with a the shaman and doing little shamanic ceremonies and chanting and that sort of thing. By about midnight, it was time for us to leave. And Bob said... I want to spend the night here. I said, well, 
yeah, you could do that. It's going to be kind of cold. He says, no, I'm bundled up. I'm all set for this. <clears throat> now, just down to the right, because the Temple of Pachamama, it's just right here, and then it's a drop-off. And it comes in, it goes over that direction a piece, and then there are some of these, they're not caves, but the llama sleep in there. There's straw, and it's very comfortable. He says, I'll go over there. That's where I was at this afternoon. So I said, fine. Go ahead. If you want to do that, you have water. You know, you're going to be fine. Yeah, I'm all set. Not a, not a worry. So he went over there. We went back to the bus, and we went down. They never did count how many people were there or anything. There was no concern for that. I was the one in charge. The next morning, we're going back up to Machu Picchu. And when we go up to Machu Picchu, here's Bob walking down the road. And he looks rather troubled. So we stop the bus. He's no more than a mile away from Agua Caliente. And so I get off and said, uh, um, what's going on? We're coming up to meet you. He says, I can't talk right now. And he just took off walking again. Now, there was someone who was with him, a friend. And his friend got off and talked to him before the bus continued and came back in and said, something happened up there. I don't know what it was. So we went on and went on up to Machu Picchu and spent the day again. Nothing incredible happened. It was just a fun time. We went back up that night. And I was thinking about Rich. I hadn't seen him. So I'm wondering, you know, what's going on. And this evening, we're going to um, the, um, the, the Intihuatana. And, of course, I'm sure if you don't know the lay of the land, it doesn't mean anything. But it's, it's that big, massive stone piece with, like, a, a plug sticking up out of it. And at the time, we could go there and sit on the Intihuatana and do a meditation and so forth. And everyone loved doing that. That's the reason we're there for this evening. So folks are taking their time, going there, spending a few minutes. Then the next person, and there was about 20 people. And I've seen this many times. I've done it many times. So I'm allowing them to just do their thing. And I'm just going to go over here and have a cigarette and just enjoy the evening. Beautiful night. Very dark. While I'm standing on this pre precipice, there's a part there near the Intihuatana that juts out kind of like a horseshoe. There's nothing there but just some rock, you know, sticking out of the ground, kind of low. A lot of dirt. And I'm standing there just looking out over the grounds at Machu Picchu. Finish my cigarette. Put it in my pocket. Turn around. I'm walking. And I hear the sound of cellophane. And the cellophane sound was not natural. So I stopped. I was about as far as from here. If I'm standing here from here to that end of the stage with my back to it. I stop, I turn around, and take a look, and there's Rich. Now, you'd have to see this probably to understand clearly, but there's no way to get there except to go past me. This, this precipice is not as wide as the stage is, and it's nearly as long, however, it just sort of juts out. And there's cactus and sharp rocks, and it'd be like, yeah, you could climb up there, but my God, in the dark, that would just be murderous. There's Rich standing there. And I walked over and I said, Rich? He says, hi, nice evening, isn't it? I said, how did you get here? I didn't hear you come this way. I didn't see you. He says, well, I have my ways. And he did like this, 
and on his belt was a little thing that looked like a, a shiny Zippo lighter. As a matter of fact, I can show you. Whoa, this thing is on. Give me a second. I'm wired. So he shows me this uh, little device. Another noise here for a second. There we go. It's not quite as big as this is. This is a Zippo lighter. <clears throat> and right in the very center, near the, near the top part, like right up in here, is just kind of a circular blue color. Now, we have seen these things in our, our world today. They're just little touch buttons. You just touch it, and it works, like a fingernail, or fingernail, fingerprint scanner. But back then, this is in the mid-90s, you never seen such a thing. It was a beautiful blue color. And I said, that's how you got here? And he said, yeah. I said, okay. He said, we need to talk. I said, okay, what do you want to talk about? He says, well, I've been talking to the other folks that I'm here with, and they're also archaeologists, uh, they're geologists, they're sociologists, and we decided that we'd like to make you a proposition. We've, we've looked deeper into who you are and what you're doing. I said, okay, well, what is your idea? He says, well, from the, the sociological, anthropolo anthropological perspective, we would like to meet the people that you bring here. I said, well, that sounds fine to me. He says, but they can't know who we are. All right. He said, because if they know who we are, the questions we ask them are going to be slanted in a way that they're trying to talk to someone not from their world. We just want to be like everybody else, just ask them questions about themselves, their lives, what their likes and dislikes are, and so forth, if that's okay with you. I said, you know, I think that makes sense, because if they knew they were talking to a Pleiadian, I'm sure they'd have a whole different range of things. And Rich says, and of course, there'd be a long ensuing conversation. And we'd rather it be something that people don't know that we're here doing this, because it could cause problems for us. I said, all right, that sounds reasonable. So I agreed to it. So, from that point on, for the next four years, I think, maybe five, because I really don't recall exactly now, I would go down to Peru twice a year with a group, anywhere from 20 to 30 people, and there would be, and I didn't really even know who they were, not until later, but there would always be these travelers who would show up either in Iquitos, or once we got to the Sacred Valley, and they would kind of tag along, show up the same times our group would show up at places like Oyante Tambo, um, or even around Cusco, but mostly in the Sacred Valley or Machu Picchu. They'd show up and have dinner in Agua Caliente. Maybe people would just make friends with them up there, and they'd come back down, let's all have dinner together, woohoo, it's a great time. And Rich said, in return, we'll pass on some information to you. Well, what kind of information are you going to pass on, Rich? He said, well, it's just the sort of thing that there are, there are things that you probably would like to know, you have questions, and we're willing to answer to the best of our ability in return for your being so gracious as to allow this. And I said, Rich, is it going to be all right if I tell them afterwards? And he says, probably not a good idea. He says, you do what you feel is the best. 
So I just kept it mostly to myself. The information that Rich passed on to me, I wrote it down so many years ago, but there were a number of things that were important, I thought. And he said, there's always going to be one thing that we're going to tell you that will be the proof so that you'll know that everything else we're telling you is going to be accurate. Because some of the things we're going to tell you happens in the distant future and some in the near future. But we'll always give you pieces that are very close to happening now. So he did. He told me things. And these things, they all came to pass. They were all highly accurate. Um, at one junction, I was again down in Peru with another group. And Rich warned me that there was a group of extraterrestrials in Brazil who were landing on a mountain, kind of a mesa at the top of a mountain, I guess like a plateau. And the people were going with them and not coming back. And I'd heard about this, but I didn't know much of the details. And Rich said, don't even think about going there. They're not who you think they are, and if you go with them, we'll never see you again, and there's nothing we can do to help you. It wouldn't be but another month and a half that I'd be talking to Jim Hertak, who has off and on been a pretty good friend over the years. And he was going to go check it out. I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I told him what Rich had told me. Where this gets even more interesting has to do with the Phoenix Lights. So we're going to jump forward in time a bit. Because the experiences with Rich, they went on and on and on. There were many UFO sightings. There were many contacts between the people that I was taking to Peru and those people with Rich. There was even one night where there was a party where I was playing bass guitar with a band at a Cuckoo's, which is a local international hangout spot in Cusco. I invited them. They all showed up. All of them. And as soon as I was done, they smiled and waved, and they all left. So there were a lot of different interactions with these folks, and they're really good people. So far as I can tell, they're just golden. One night, there was this opportunity where which had told me if I go out at a certain time, which was very late at night, at least for me, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, that uh, there was going to be this ship that was going to fly over. It was huge. And that I'd have a chance to see their geophysical survey ship. I thought, well, that sounds great. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be this big. He says, it's very large very understated. This thing must have been a mile from one side to the other. It was shaped like, kind of like a V, but a spread apart V. Almost like an equilateral triangle without one of the legs in the back. Had lights underneath of it, had some um, very bright lights down there. And he said it was going to be going past at a certain time and sure enough I was out there and according to Rich this was a, a mission where they were studying fault lines along this part of the Andes and he told me it was going to extend and go all the way up into uh, Canada before they were finished. It was going to take them several months and as a result of that uh, I'd probably have another chance to see it or at least probably hear about it. Well, it was several months later. I think uh, the Phoenix Lights was sometime in March. And I was there, as I recall, it was probably August of the year before. <clears throat> so, one of the things that I noticed about this was that it had very, and I've seen this on other UFOs as well, they have very peculiar lighting. Some are orange, some are white, some are blue. And I asked Rich about this, and he said that the light is going to be an indicator of who they are 
what they're doing and how you can know who they are. And this is how we know each other at a distance. Because the light is oscillating at a very high frequency and it's kind of a beacon. The color spectrum of the light is one indicator <clears throat> and the flicker of the light is another. These are not incandescent, they're like LED I suppose. But when they oscillate so fast, you really can't see them, like these things. These are oscillating right now so fast you can't see it. Well, when the Phoenix lights occurred, I wasn't outside to see it. I was in Village Labs playing music with Susan Gordon and Jim Delatoso. We were rehearsing for another show, and it went right over Phoenix. But there were people who were able to take video or, or film of this, like uh, Dr. Lynn Keaty. So I tried to get the information out there that this light had a very specific signature, and if you could capture the signature of the light, but you really couldn't do that with film. You really couldn't do it with, you couldn't do it at all with video. You'd have to have a device that's actually made so you can hook it up maybe to binoculars, I don't know. But if you had a photo transistor or something to capture the light and translate that into a signal, then you could tell exactly what was going on. But since there wasn't any way of doing that, I mean, you couldn't even get a good color temperature of the light with video or with film because both of these have their own limitations. And I mention that because I think it's important for any future UFO encounters or sightings. There is a way that you can, you can figure this out. Now in respect, respect to the, um, the rest of the story, <clears throat> after a few years, there were obviously fewer people going to Peru and I had other interests, and so it kind of slowed down and slid off to the side. Then Kathy and I got together, and we ended up going back to Peru again. On one occasion, I had an issue with a plane, getting on a plane, with a trinket that I'd picked up from the jungle. <clears throat> and this tall black man offered some advice to Kathy on what to do, and so we did it. When we got to Cusco, he was back on the street. Now, he wasn't on our flight, but now he's on the streets in Cusco. I was real surprised to see him there. And he asks, how did it turn out? And, of course, by this time, I get to meet him and shake his hand and thank him. He had the most interesting eyes. I think they were blue. Very clear. And as a matter of fact, Rich's eyes, they were just a pale, transparent blue. Very unique. And this fellow had the same kind of eyes. He had very similar earlobes. And so after thanking him, he wished us well, and on the crowded streets there in Cusco, he turned and walked off and walked about as far as from the front row to me, perhaps, and he just vanished. He was just gone. It would be another few years, and we would be sitting at a place called Pizza Street in Lima. This is in Miraflores. It's a very famous place. It's a very narrow alley, pavilion of sorts, and on both sides, everybody's got restaurants, and they're just really hawking their restaurant, trying to get you to eat. And there are just hordes of people. Kathy and I are sitting there with some friends, and she noticed that there was a fellow standing at a distance, probably 30, 40 feet away. And of course, the folks in Peru are short. And this guy is tall. And he's just staring. And Kathy goes, Jer, that guy over there is just staring at us. I go, where? 
And so I took a look around, and there he was. It was Rich. And he just got this big smile, waved, nodded his head, turned around, and walked off into the crowd, and vanished. They're still down there. They're still here with us. Where they are, I couldn't tell you. They move around quite a bit. I think the important point here is that you never know when you might be encountering one of these people. They don't want you to know that they're from elsewhere because they have a specific agenda. And it's not malicious. It's out of curiosity or to perhaps advance what they know or to add to what they know about who we are as a society. The one thing that I did learn from Rich that I thought was poignant. He told me that people didn't originate on this world. That they came from the stars and we've just forgotten who we are. And that there are people out there just like yourselves living on other worlds, fixing themselves a sandwich, doing their work, whatever that might be having their lives, and they're out there right now. And just as I'm standing here, speaking with you, there's probably one of them somewhere in the Sacred Valley or at Machu Picchu, walking around, laughing with someone about something that they thought was funny, and asking them a question, what do you think about this? So that's it, folks. I don't know how much more time I've got, but I'm sure you must have questions. So if you do, go ahead. I'll be happy to answer any of them. Questions, Mike. And where is that? It's over here? Right there. Very good. Go ahead. There you go. Yeah, you were talking about how Rich said that about ETs were landing on a mountain in Brazil and that people were going with them but would not return. You said that they were malicious. Like, do you, did they, do you mention like who exactly they were and like where they were going and was like, was it just, were they going to do experiments on them or something or what? It was never made clear to me. I was so curious about it. I wanted to go to Brazil and find out for myself. I mean, you know, to go there wasn't dangerous. It was to go with them. And I figured if I went there, I might be able to find some answers. Jim Hurtak was going, so I made him aware of this. <clears throat> but I haven't heard if he ever got any information. This has been many years ago as well. Um, there are always things like this going on. And how do you know if they're good guys or bad guys? It's just a very big mystery, and, and I'd like to find the answers as well. I'm sorry I don't have a good answer for you. Understood. Thank you for your question. Hi, Terry. Nice Hi. to see you. Thank you. So, have you seen your friend Rich lately? Not lately, no. Um, it's been quite a few years. I've never okay. seen him in the States. Okay. It's always been down in South America. Oh, okay. So, you probably have to go there to see him because that's probably where he hangs, huh? Well, I guess, but, you know, he was in Venice. But if you've ever been to Venice, how would you pick him out among the people there, you know? Especially if he happens to be wearing, like, you know, gold briefs and riding a unicycle. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you see him soon again. Thank you. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> Jerry, Brian Forster. I was on, in an interview with you and Lloyd Pye. Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. Good to finally meet you. It's a pleasure. I was wondering what your thoughts are <clears throat> since, um, since Lloyd died, almost nothing has been done with the Star Child skull. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about its authenticity. Well, I would like to find out myself, just as uh, you and I have discussed in the past. Um, what was that? Red Ice Radio, I think, we, yeah. were, we were on while we were in Peru. No, I think there's something to it. And interestingly enough, Brian, I've, uh, in our travels in the distant parts of the Andes, we've run into at least two other ones just like it. 
But because our policy is not to touch anything, disturb anything, leave it for the archaeologists, the authorities, we just left it there. Mm -hmm. And these things, is, you probably run into this. You run into something and it's, it's like you're right in the middle of things and the picture isn't even taken. But we have run into it. And um, actually, I did get a picture of one of them. Well, anyway, I'm curious as well. There's something strange there. Well, just to tell you, I'm uh, associated with a very small museum in Paracas on the coast of Peru. Yeah, and I know we, the one you're talking about. And we have one there. Oh, cool. Maybe that's where I saw the other one at, because oh, I was trying be. to remember where the hell it was. Next time we're down, I'll have to drop in and take a look. Yeah. Give me a call. We can meet up. That'd be great, Brian. Good to meet you, buddy. Pleasure. Hey, good afternoon, and, or good morning, rather. It's Dan. A uh, question for you. I've got two questions, and hopefully we can cover both of them. Uh, the first is, did, was there any distinction that was made between the individual that you call rich and calling himself a Palladian and other people who call or other entities calling themselves Palladians? Yes. And, and then the other question is, what role does humor or laughter play from their perspective in their experience? They have a really different sense of humor, almost like the British do. <laughs> the parrot's not dead, it's just sleeping. The, um, I don't know, the peculiarity about the humor, I, I tried to do some jokes and they tried to do some jokes and neither one of us got the joke. <laughs> Over the course of five years, I finally got to understand that when they're laughing, they're just looking at you or the grin. That's their laughter. As far as the way that the others looked, the people that I saw who were also from within this group of rich, I mean, they must have been because they were with him. It was a woman, uh, about as tall as Annie DeRiso, pretty like her. There was this fellow that looked like a kung fu guy with white eyes and Fu Manchu and long hair. He looked very Asian. Another fellow was a black guy. Uh, another gal was just kind of like this gal right here. I mean, they, they were just like people. The only difference was their eyes were extraordinarily clear. I mean, like we, you can see it's like blue, it's just boom, and it's blue. But this is transparent, and that was the big difference that I saw. You're very welcome. There's a, an, an adoptee called T Derek Tyler. He wrote a book called Alien Contact, The Paradigm Shift. And in his book, he talks about you a little. He says that you and him are good friends. He, he says that he claimed that you're from the Tau Ceti star system and that you had the ability to like, heal him from like, certain diseases. Is he just making all this up or is there truth to some of this? Uh, the imagination is a great thing, isn't it? It is. It's all true. I work as a healer in my regular day-to-day -day job. I fix things that are broken in people. Some of these things no one else can help them with. It's not every one that I fix, but quite a number of them. As far as my origins, that's a whole other story. Probably would take up way too much time, and these folks have questions. But my origin is something a bit different. And I'm sure that uh, if you take a look, you'll find the answers. I've made no mystery about it. Thank you for your question. Hi, Jerry. It's Sharon. I knew you and Kathy since Nebraska. I know. It's good to see you, kiddo. Yeah, You're looking I, just as cute as ever. Thanks. <laughs> you look great, too. <laughs> Thank you. I just had a question about the earlobes. You mentioned the eyes, but then you mentioned the earlobes were the same. What is it about the earlobes? They're just kind of long. <clears throat> Not pointy, just long. And if you take a look at some of the, um, I think it was Egyptian, but take a look at some of the ancient cultures, you'll see the same earlobes. It really, Kathy pointed that out to me. 
And I thought it was extraordinary. So that's how you could kind of get a visual on it if you wanted to. Okay. Thanks. Thank Let's you, Sherry. Later. Good to see you. Hi, thank you for all the information. I was curious as to the, you, we're talking about the light um, on the ships and the color patterns of the lights. Could you elaborate on what we're supposed to be looking for as, what, as far as what colors we should be looking for or um, what patterns we should be looking for? Are there specific colors that are better than others, like you said? I don't know that there's any that's better than others. Most specifically, when you see a UFO and it has like a solid light, not a blinking light, a solid light, if you had just a very simple circuit, anyone who knows electronics could come up with this. It's basically um, an op amp connected to a phototransistor just to boost the signal and then send that over so you can record the signal, which is simple stuff. You can analyze that signal. You have to take into account atmospheric aberration because there's going to be atmospheric aberration at a distance. But if you can calculate that out of it, then you can get the exact signature of that signal. <clears throat> and like <clears throat> UFOs that are like each other, like the same craft, like this big thing that I saw down there that apparently flew over Phoenix too, um, if you can get that signature and match it to that signature, they're going to be the same. Because they're giving, it's like a beacon or uh, an identifier for others. There are also these smaller craft that um, I call them, they're kind of like drones. They're just small. Maybe the size of the camera, perhaps. And they're orange. They look like a, like a, a cigarette fire in the dark. Um, so this thing, oh, I didn't tell you about what happened with Rich. When he said goodbye, he touched on his side here, and the same crackling sound turn into a blue, just a little blue sphere. It just flew off. And I saw that several times. I asked him if I could borrow it. Do you think that the sound has relevance to the light? Do you think that maybe it's um, like they're both interconnected? You mean there's the crackling sound? Yeah, do you think that maybe it's deep? I, don't know. I think the sound is in relation to the dynamic of whatever whatever properties are going on that condenses him into that sphere. If that's really what's happening. I really don't know. But it's kind of like a static discharge of sorts. Okay. Awesome. That would be my guess. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, sweetie. Hi, Jerry. You'd mentioned what you did for Rich. So what did, uh, uh, how did he reciprocate? Did he give you some energetic skills or tell you where some hidden treasure was? What was it? Nothing like that. He basically told me what was going to happen in the future. As I found out from Rich, they travel in a nonlinear way. I understand that, yes. What we think of as next week is something they can just jump to and jump back from. So they would always give me a check, which means I would be finding out something specific from him that was going to happen near future. And then he would tell me there would be other things that would be happening distant future and to be aware of these things. Are there any coming up in our future? Most of the things he told me have already come to pass. So nothing new? No, and I'd like to find out if there is anything. So, you know, if Rich, if you're watching. You know. Great, thank you. Thank you for your question. Hey, how's it going? So you said that Palladians have a sick sense of humor, right? Yes. So with us asking all these questions, what do you think the odds are that there's an alien among us right now? I'd say it's, it's quite likely. Are you making a joke? Because no. you kind of are making a joke like a Pleiadian. <laughs> you think I could be one? <laughs> you know, the truth is, it could be any one of us. You know, not, not to be, you know, goofy, but it really is. I mean, you don't know. You just don't know until you've actually had that conversation. There's something, there's something that takes place when you're talking with one of them that's just like unmistakable. It might seem kind of weird or for some people it might seem a little intimidating, spooky perhaps. But when it occurs, 
you are left feeling like there's something that's just occurred and I've got to explain it within myself somehow. That's how it was with Rich. Because he and I parted ways as I was taking my group into Machu Picchu and we met up again and the, one of the primary reasons we met up is because I was trying to reconcile what the hell was that? So that's how it worked for me and there could be people here. How many of you here are from another world right now? That's the guy right there. Oh, see, there's a few here already. And they look just like us. It's very difficult to tell one from the other. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your question. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew. It's a pleasure to meet you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Hello, Steve. Jerry, uh, are the Georgia Guidestones related in any way to this phenomenon? Not that I'm aware of. I have been there. Have you been to it? No. It's, it's really quite a thing. Georgia Guidestones. If you haven't seen, look it up. Georgia Guidestones. If you have a chance, go there and see this. It, it's just a real puzzling thing. Uh, I don't know if it's dark or just creepy. Yes. Hi. Um, in your conversations with... Um, in your conversations, did he ever talk about spirituality and what Pleiadians think about spirituality and how, it, how it's a part of their life? We had that conversation. I just didn't bring it up because I didn't figure it was something anybody would want to know about. But uh, in particular, in a, just a thumbnail sketch, they believe that there is a creator. Our version of religion is not nothing at all like what their version of their religious reality would be, let's say. It's kind of like if you were talking to someone from another world about their religion. It really is that vastly different. But I found that their version made much more sense than ours. It isn't segregated, it isn't demeaning or demanding, and it doesn't require you to be anything but yourself and in its purest form in order to participate, unlike how it is here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. What was your name? Marie. Marie, thank you, Marie. You were talking about how Rich predicted about the Phoenix likes. Did you by any chance say like who exactly was behind it and what the whole purpose of, you know, letting of, of, you know, being flown across Phoenix was? It wasn't just Phoenix. They were flying all the way from South America, and the point was to mat, map out. Uh, the uh, the geology they they were following I guess fault lines or some geology some geophysical as it was a geophysical survey on their part and if you take a look which I did after this what I discovered is that if you draw a line from Canada go all the way down south this just volcano after volcano there are fault lines all over the place um. So it had something to do with that, but I don't know any more detail than that. They just said this is what they're doing, and that was it. Right, Thank you for your question. What was your name? Captain David Yates. Captain David Yates. Are you a Starfleet officer by any chance? Uh, yeah, perhaps so. I am. <laughs> Good to meet you, Captain. Hello, there are some sources that believe that Pleiadians were the ones who originated us as Homo sapiens race um, and in essence seeded us, creating the race with 22 chromosomes unlike any other species. Did the rich ever say anything about it? A little. Not a whole lot because our conversations didn't really go that direction. Um, and you have to understand that in the time that I had to talk with them, it was brief, maybe five, ten minutes. It was always a pleasure, of course, but I didn't really have lengthy conversations uh, at all. But it was mentioned that there are people just like us on other worlds, and that the Pleiades was a focal point, and that it was a focal point for um, knowledge, the to be stored, I guess. And there was something about the great Lyrian Wars and how 
the successive fall of that empire led to other things happening and so on and so on. Um, but I don't know enough to be conversational about it. I hear you. Thank you very much. What's your question? Or what's your name? Marjana. Marjana. Marjana? Yes. Thank you for your question. Hey, Jerry. Brad Olson. Hey, Brad. We spoke uh, on a radio interview a couple of years ago. Yes, we did. Remember. And you had a great story of giving a presentation and the men in black showed up. Yeah, that You're, was creepy. Tell me about that. And you had to like call them out by having everybody turn around and look at them. And then they, they don't like uh, the spotlight shined on them and they disappeared. Well, they didn't disappear. They, had, they were basically, it was a smaller room than this. And they had warned me before I was going up on stage not to talk about what I was going to talk about. And so I invited them in. I said, okay, I won't. <laughs> I had a couple friends. There was door there and there, and then one off to the side here. And it was, like I say, a smaller room, more, much more confined. Mm, this group of chairs and not that one, full of people. They were in the back. I told my buddy, who was a muscle man, to not let them out. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like that. Well, they didn't like it so much when I went up and started talking. They said, well, I was going to tell you this stuff, but, well, the men in black are sitting right back there, and they told me I shouldn't talk about this. So why don't you, what, do you, should I do this or not? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, they don't think I should. Everybody turns and looks. They couldn't get out. I said, if you want to leave, come up this way, the door's right there. And they had to march right in front of everybody. Yeah, that was a great story. But I do have a question. Yes. Uh, I love your material on South America. I'm going to do a presentation on that on Tuesday. And you know about the Stargate at Amomero. Would you elaborate a little bit about that on how people occasionally may disappear? Well, it's a series of three tones. And they, they vanish because they activate the Stargate, you know, this portal. Uh, usually it's accidental. In my case, it wasn't so much. But <clears throat> it's, um, what, what would you like me to tell you about this? Where do you go if you step through the portal? That's the problem. You don't know where the hell you're <laughs> going to go. That's why I won't do it again. If you had a way of navigating it, then sure, I mean, that would be fine. I'd, I'd give it another try. Because it didn't hurt, it was just frightening. But because you don't know where you're going to go, you know, it's a buckaroo bonsai moment, you know? Yeah. Wherever you go, there you are. And getting back, that's the other issue. And just for me to get back, it, it was just, it was horrible. It was really frightening, so... You know, I'd just soon not do that again. But it is real, and it is, and it's not the only one. There are other, there are other um, things like this around the world. It's not the only one. Okay. I don't know if the other ones are working. I know one in Ecuador is, um, and I know there's one in um, what was it, southern New Mexico, uh, northwestern Texas, right in that area. There's one there that's working. It's on an Indian reservation. You can't go there. And I know there are other ones, but I just don't know how well they work or if they work, really. I mean, the only way you're going to know is to make it work, and then what's going to happen to you? Careful what you wish for. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank great. you, Brad. I'm Alan. Thank you. It's fascinating. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, you were saying that it, it could be very difficult to recognize Someone, I think the the context was if so, if someone in here is is from uh, Pleiades or wherever. Sure. That, but what about the the transparent eyes and the and the long earlobes, or do they not all have those features? Only ones that I've seen that I knew were they were like that. Uh, but you can get contacts that look like that too. Say that again. Contact? You can get contact lenses that look like that. Oh, okay. So, consequently, how would you know? Uh -huh. 
there's a vibe about them, and that's one of the ways you would find out. Wow. Okay. It's a bit of a, uh, it's a very subjective thing. I see. The other question uh, is uh, the descriptions of some of the other uh, species that I've, I've heard about um, portray them as, as being very aloof and, and uh, here only for their own interests, and they, they really are not much interested in, in Earth people. Um, but your description of the Pleiadians uh, makes them sound a little friendlier, more personable. Well, I are thought they, they were pretty nice. Are they? Uh, did you get the impression that they were concerned about us at all, or concerned about the the destruction of the, of the planet through? No, I didn't get that idea at all. Well, what I got from it was basically that they were scientists, and they were gathering and adding to data, and they were friendly, like any person would be. But they weren't um, making any overtures to uh, say, you need to do this or need to do that. I think it's the responsibility of any civilization to have enough sense to know what you should and shouldn't be doing. The problem is, we as a, a people need to have complete access to knowledge in order to make the right determination on what we should and shouldn't be doing, and we're limited in how much we know. We are instead pointed in a direction of thought and action. And then we think we're doing the right thing and we don't know that we are or if we aren't. So for them, knowledge was key. Information was very important. As important as it is for us. It's just unfortunate we don't have access to as much as we need to make the right decisions. Does that help? It does. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Hi, Jerry. My name's Frankie. I have a three-parter, and uh, here it is. Do did they give you any healing powers? No. Are the loud? You're going to be loud. Did they give you any healing powers? No. Are they telepathic? Yes. Do they like rock and roll? Yes. They all, Rich likes jazz, too, but none of them like blues except for the black guy, which I thought was very stereotypical. All right. <clears throat> I'm Paul. Hello, uh, Paul. Did, uh, you, do you think that they're related to the Pleiadians that Billy Myers writes about? It's I think so. I asked him about that. <clears throat> he says, well, that was us, but don't believe everything you, you read. And that was all he said about it. Like uh, Myers was saying, they were living to be like a thousand years old. Do you think that's true? Or? I don't know. They didn't talk about their age. Right? No, they didn't really. I mean, he didn't look to be that old, but he could have been very old. Of course, I'm very old, and I don't look to be that old either, so. <laughs> vitamins. <laughs> I'd be interested in the vitamins you take. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I think that we are about finished. Might have even gone over. I'm sorry if we have. Go ahead, Jerry. I want to thank all of you for taking the time this morning to come here <clears throat> and be in the audience and to be a part of this. Come and, and say hello to see me. It means a lot to me. It really does. It's a real privilege to be here. I hope the things that I've told you have perhaps some value that you'll be able to take something away that you'll be able to use. And that's all. Thank you, guys.